Hello and welcome to yet another episode of Pale Blue Thoughts. Now that we have one cam out of the way, it is time to look at the next form of alternate healing. This one might be more difficult to eradicate as it is steeped in our tradition and culture. This form of holistic healing is heavily practiced in India and Nepal, where around 80% of the population report using it. But then, that doesn't mean that it should be out of inquiry, right? At the end of the day, if it doesn't conform to the scientific method, it would need to be called as zero scientific, irrespective of its popularity. So this is my plan of action for this series. In this episode, we will see the theory and rationale behind this healing system to see how scientific it is. Then in future episodes, we will go into detail about what is written in the sacred texts of Ayurveda. How many of you really know what is written in the ancient texts of Ayurveda like Susruta Samhita, Charaka Samhita and Ashtanga Hridaya? I am very much sure that none of you would have even bothered to look it up. So I will help you a bit here. Many people think that these texts contain a lot of ancient wisdom and therapeutic techniques that even modern medicine of today is not able to decipher even after 5000 years. Be prepared to roll your eyeballs over as I was pretty much shocked when I read these texts. Only two sets of people actually know what is written in those texts. The students who study these as part of their course and their tutors and people who actually take the time out to read what is written in these books. But this shouldn't be enough, right? The common folks who believe in this form of system and believe that this would cure their ailment should also realize what archaic secrets are hidden in these texts, right? So that is the reason for doing this series. So with a note of thanks to the scientists and doctors at the Science Brigade, let me begin my very own Charaka Samhita rendition for the benefit of people who can understand English. Many people think that Ayurveda has been with us for over 5000 years. Well, this is not true. The evidence for that comes from examining the phylogenetic tree of languages such as Sanskrit in which these texts were supposedly written. Contrary to popular belief, Sanskrit is not an Indian language. It is part of the Indo-Aryan branch of the Indo-European languages which is native to Western and Southern Eurasia which includes Europe, the Iranian plateau and the north part of India. All Indo-European languages are descended from a single prehistoric language called as Proto-Indo-European which existed around 3000 BCE which is around 5000 years old. However, Sanskrit took even longer to develop and the most archaic version, the Vedic Sanskrit which is found in the Rig Veda was composed around 1500 and 1200 BCE which is around 3500 years ago max. The two major Sanskrit epics, the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, however were composed in epic Sanskrit which was used in northern India between 400 BCE and 300 CE around 2400 years ago. Classical Sanskrit has its beginning around 1 CE which is around 2000 years old and it is in this language that Ayurveda is written. So if you look at the phylogenetic tree Ayurveda couldn't have been in existence 5000 years ago but can be best found around 2000 years at the most. That too, it's a rough estimate and many scholars and historians believe it may be newer than that. The main classical Ayurveda texts begin with accounts of the transmission of medical knowledge from the gods to sages and then to human physicians. In Susruta Samhita, Susruta wrote that Danvantri, the Hindu god of Ayurveda, incarnated himself as the king of Varanasi and taught medicine to a group of physicians, including Sushruta. Ayurveda developed significantly during the Vedic period and later some of the non-Vedic systems such as Buddhism and Jainism also developed medical concepts and practices that appear in the classic Ayurveda texts. Therapies include herbal medicines, special diets, meditation, yoga, massage, laxatives, enemas and medical oils. Medicines are typically based on complex herbal compounds, minerals and heavy metals and some really crazy stuff which you wouldn't think about. More on that later. You may have already seen the pseudoscientific principles under which homeopathy operates. 
vital force, dynamic energy and infinite dilution. Ayurveda fares no better. It is based on three doshas, vata, pitta and kapha. What are these? No one really knows for sure. You can't see it, quantify it or measure it in any way. It is similar to the vital force, but Ayurveda claims that the balance of these three doshas determine health. According to Ayurveda, the human body is composed of tissues or dhatus, waste or malas and biomaterials doshas. The seven dhatus are plasma or rasa, blood rakta, muscles mamsa, fat medha, bone asti, marrow majja and semen shukra. Ayurveda has historically divided bodily substances into five classical elements that is the pancha mahabhuta that is earth, water, fire, air and ether. There are also 20 gunas or qualities or characteristics which are considered to be inherent in all matter. Pretty complicated but has no logic or rationality if we were to consider what we know of the human body these days. Of course, these were written at a time when the people had no idea about how to approach things logically and scientifically and observations were taken as evidence. The three elemental bodily humors, the doshas or tridoshas to be exact, are vata which is space or air equated with the nervous system, pitta, fire equated with enzymes today but in those days dealt with digestion and kapha, earth and water equated with mucus. As per the ancient text, each human possesses a unique combination of the doshas which define that person's temperament and characteristics. In either case, it says that each person should modulate their behavior or environment to increase or decrease the doshas and maintain their natural state. I will give you an example from a text to explain this better. For example, a person who is thin, shy, excitable, has a pronounced Adam's apple and has some secret knowledge is likely vata prakriti and therefore more susceptible to conditions such as flatulence which is basically what we call as gas in our stomach, stuttering and rheumatism. Don't bother looking for a logical connection, you are not going to find any. Sushruta described the pranavayu as the force which sets the whole organism into motion although in Mahabharata the same is mentioned as a force similar to electricity. It is described in a very vague manner in his text. However, the people who try and paint it in scientific colors now equate it to the cerebrospinal and sympathetic nervous system by giving it modern scientific meanings. Pitta similarly is painted to represent human metabolism even though Pitta in Sanskrit means bile and body heat generated due to metabolism. Pitta in Ayurveda encompasses blood and other bodily fluids like semen and also is supposed to indirectly affect the cardiac contractions. However, it is to be noted that the text mentioned the heart as Vuddhisthanam or the seat of cognition. The poor brain doesn't get featured here. It is also supposed to give us the ability to see and also produces perspiration. Totally unrelated and disjoint features of human functions all rolled into one. Kapha or Sleshma is something which is supposed to fill all the intercellular spaces of the body in a cooling embrace. The text mentioned that if it is not so, there would be a dreadful combustion due to heat caused by food, air, etc. It is also mentioned that the Kapha is a byproduct of digestion and the Kapha gets transformed into blood, bones, flesh, fat, semen etc under the influence of the metabolic heat. There are many more such useless and incorrect information about the human anatomy spread all through the text. But for the sake of time, I am skipping them and carrying on. Basically, it is a comedy of errors written at a time when people had no clue about the internal organs and human physiology. Plant-based treatments in Ayurveda may be derived from roots, leaves, fruits, bark or seeds. In most cases, many different parts of plants are often mixed together. Animal products used in Ayurveda include milk, bones, gallstones, semen, urine and even feces. Well, don't wrinkle your face. I will present evidences later on from their very own texts. In addition, 
Fats are prescribed both for consumption and for external use. Consumption of minerals and heavy metals including the highly toxic sulfur, arsenic, lead, copper sulfate and gold are also prescribed. The addition of minerals to herbal medicine is called Rasa Sastra which is an ancient form of alchemy. Ayurveda uses alcoholic beverages called Madhya which are said to adjust the doshas by increasing Pitta and reducing Vata and Kapha. Ayurvedic texts describe Madhya as a sticky substance and fast acting and say that it enters and cleans minute pores in the body. Does it really now? Opium is used in many Ayurvedic preparations and is said to balance the Vata and Kapha doshas and increase the Pitta dosha. It is prescribed for diarrhea and dysentery, for increasing the sexual and muscular ability and for affecting the brain. It is also mentioned as an ingredient of an aphrodisiac to delay male ejaculation. It is also used as a pain reliever. Cannabis is also mentioned in the Sushruta Samhita not for getting high or as a painkiller but for treatment of diarrhea. In another book it is used as an ingredient in an aphrodisiac, something which enhances sexual powers. Ayurveda says that both oil and tar can be used to stop bleeding and severe bleeding can be stopped by tying a string around the blood vessel or by burning away that part of the skin. Need I say more? There are a lot of anatomical anomalies in these sacred texts as well as we will see in future episodes. But before I end this episode, I would like to state a few of them. Susruta states that there are 360 bones in the human body as per the Vedas but a surgical science recognizes 300 bones. Today, we know that it is only 206. He also states in his embryology section that a fetus happens when the male sperm fuses with the menstrual blood of the female. When the maternal element or the menstrual blood is more, then the child is a female. When the male component is more, it would be a male and when they are equal, then the child has no sex. And when the seed is divided into two by the force of Vayu, twins are born. Life force or vital force is also mentioned in the text which makes a comical reading for those who may be interested. As mentioned earlier in my videos, this life force or vitalism principle has long been discarded by modern science since Wooler's synthesis of urea. But students who study Ayurveda today still learn about this outdated concept. Sushruta also mentions that breast milk is a metamorphosed form of menstrual blood. He also talks about a condition where a human can exist without food and respiration and then goes on to completely quantum entanglement type explanation of the Jivatma. In Ayurveda, it is not the parents who makes a child, but it is the child who chooses his or her parents even before he or she is conceived. The self of the child who is about to come to life chooses its own parents and it mixes with the self of its parents and hovers over the reproductive cells and regulates the sexual intensity of its parents' sexual desire. They also believed that conception without sexual union is possible in women. How scientific and modern concept, right? Today, even a 10 standard student may scoff at this, but the people who take medical degrees in this form of medicine swallow it whole and believe it to be true. The description of Ojas puts string theory concepts to shame. Have a read and if you understand anything, please tell me what you have been drinking or smoking. Fever has been mentioned as a disease of defective digestion and excretion. I could go on and on, but in order to spare you from hearing all the comedies at one go, I will pause here only to return with more classical text errors in future episodes. People mistake the Ayurvedic texts to think that they contain some ancient source of wisdom. But in the contemporary world, with our current knowledge of the human anatomy and physiology, it appears as hallucinations of an ancient mind. Again, I am not making any of these things up. I am reading from their own texts and all references and sources have been mentioned in the description box and screenshots of those parts are anyways visible on the screen for you. The basis of Ayurveda, the humors, has long been disregarded as a pseudoscientific principle and since this form of medicine still sticks on with it, makes it a perfect pseudoscientific material. 
the anatomy as mentioned in the text and the treatments for various diseases and some of the medicines used in Ayurveda are too good to be missed. So I hope you have learned something new from me today. If you did, please subscribe to this channel for more such videos. In case you are watching my videos for the first time, there are more than 100 videos on various aspects of science on this channel. Head over to the video section to watch them. I shall be back with more. Until next time, it's bye-bye from Pale Blue Thoughts.